Hello, everybody. Welcome along. It's another Blue Monday um, special. We have another special guest, and I always say I'm not going to waffle along. Um, Phil is here from TWTD, but um, you can see, well, I don't know, to my right or depending on which way you're looking, uh, Amazon Primes, although he didn't know it, uh, Mr. <laughs> Alan Lee. How you doing, Alan? <laughs> Hello there, guys. How are you? Yeah, well, no well, one had... No one had told you that you're a star on Amazon Prime of the Crystal Palace documentary. Uh, I, honestly, it's the first I've heard of it, but I, I'm sure I'm not the star. Uh, <laughs> we can just a cameo. Yeah, we get a pretty decent cameo at the start, stopping yeah. them from getting relegated. So, um, look, we're going to go through um, sort of your career, Alan, at Ipswich and... Um, some bits before and after and um phil's got lots of stuff on the on the after and the coaching and all of that good stuff so um we'll get into it the way the way we did with kieran die because he gave a fascinating answer um from the horse's mouth can you describe yourself as a player in your own words uh, i was a traditional number nine um i was hard working competitive i was strong in the air uh didn't I, I wasn't terrible with my feet but you know i didn't my strength wasn't coming short and twisting and turning um but i think i think i was a bit of a battler um and uh i just wish i was playing football now rather than 10 years ago well, why'd uh, you say there's that not, there's not many of us well i, I think um the game is uh, you know everyone although a lot of people are playing through the thirds you know, everyone is still looking for that number nine, that target man, that second option, and it's um, we're not we're not producing them as much. Um, but you you can do very well for yourself now if you can if you can provide that outlet for a team. Do you, do you think because there was sort of a sense that that player had gone out of out of fashion, but big direct striker pretty much will never go out of fashion, will it? Until they ban heading. Um. Yeah, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> no, it, it doesn't. I mean, so, like even in, I, I've been involved in teams and you kind of, you pre-season goes on and everyone's stroking around, everything's quite nice and you find yourself out of the team and before you know what you're on after 50 minutes, first game, right, we've got to, we, we've, got, we, we've got to make an impact here. Um, it's, a, it's a specialist position you uh there's obviously big special you know physical specimens out there but um I, I think there's a lot more craft to it i think there's a lot more specialist um it's, a, it's more of a specialist position and um you know you a lot of things you'll do as a number nine or as a target man is standing still you know and pulling away from where you want the you know pulling from the opposite side of the pitch and using your body to pin center halves and defenders, and um, so it's, you know, I'm I'm always when I when I'm talking to young center forwards or certainly strong ones, it's one of the biggest things. I think you're you're trying to jump with the center half rather than pin him, and uh, I think there's, you know, I learned a lot and got better. Uh, I got better at my trade over the years, but at the same time, my physical, my attributes, you lose your pace. You know, you have the injuries and you lose you lose your physicality. You, you don't lose your strength, but you use that ability to get around the pitch. Mm. Um, coming through at Villa, um, what sort of talk to us about big names and how you how you honed your craft there? Well, I remember um, uh, Ron Atkinson coming to the house. I originally turned down the offer. We were living in Dublin. It was kind of my background and where we lived there was no such thing as a professional footballer i went to a rugby school and um so we'd know we no one to get any advice from and we just assumed i was going to go finish school and go to university aston villa offered me a contract mum dad turned it down said you're mad of course he's not leaving school <laughs> and then Juan atkinson actually came to our house and blew mum and dad away said listen you can sign for four years he can come back at any time he wants we'll give him an education over here um so off i went completely naive um at 16. i'm thinking dwight york possibly there who was at the club 
sorry, yeah, uh, at the time, Mark Bosnich, Dwight York, you know, Steve Staunton, Paul McGrath, Andy wow. Townsend, John Fashionu, um, just legends. Um, and it was, you could tell Ron Atkinson, it was kind of that, that time in football, you know, I wouldn't say they're, you know, they're not as professional, let's say. We, we all know about Paul <laughs> McGrath, but um, I just remember the, the, the uh, Dalian Atkinson, didn't mention him, oh. the characters, uh, you had to be so tough to survive in that. You know, I wasn't part of that first team, don't get me wrong, but the characters were just amazing. But they were good players. They were, you know, Paul McGrath was absolutely, he, he never trained, arrived in on a match day. He'd, had a, he'd have a rub during the week, but he'd arrive in with an aura on a match day, head fine, and he would just run the game. And you, you couldn't figure out, you know, what, you know, how he did it. Um, I remember early days, like training with, every so often you'd get to train with them. Um, I'll never forget Daly and Atkinson. I was, you know, my team, Daly and Atkinson was the opposition team. Daly and Atkinson got the ball, knocked it past me, and went five <laughs> yards past me, knocking me over in the process with pace and power. And I remember feeling, I am, um, you know, I'm on a different planet to this guy. This, you know, how, how do I ever get to that? You know, it was awe inspiring. Um, but we, uh, Brian Little took over. Um, I was, I spent my first year, as kids do, just turning up, not really working hard, thinking, right, the coach puts on a session. I go through the session and um, my next year, my second year, pretty much started the same way. And uh, a coach came in, Tony McAndrew, really hard, tough Scotsman. And he was just on my case the whole time. And initially I thought, oh, he hates me. He doesn't like me. Blaming the coach, this, that, and the other. And it wasn't until he took me off one time in my second year. Uh, he took me off after 20 minutes and didn't bollock me like he normally did. He said, sit down, son, well done. And ignored me. The next week I went home for an international. I got sent off. I could see the look in my parents' eyes. And I kind of realized I'm coming home back to Dublin, a failure here. I've got to do something about it. And it, it wasn't until then that something clicked. Actually, I'm in a race and um, I started going in early every single day and staying late every single day and asking the coach, do you want to do, will you do something? Will you sort my touch out? You know, I was a joker to that point. You know, I couldn't control the ball, you know, um, and I did that religiously and two things happened. One, I got better and two, everyone's attitude to me changed and my own attitude as well. And, um, uh, you know, I, I can't say I kept that up, that level of dedication up to my career, definitely not throughout my career, but, you know, I, I knew, I knew when to knuckle down and how to get back, back on it. So it, it was, it was a really good, I was very lucky, in my opinion, to have the people and the guidance I had, um, and indeed the instruction from my parents. You know, my parents weren't complaining to the coaches, they were saying, you've got to do something about it. Because your dad was a footballer, wasn't he? Uh, uh, amateur, uh, amateur level. Uh, uh, he, he, but he loved his football. So he, he grew up in the west of Ireland, middle of nowhere, um, listening to, with the only access to English football was on long wave radio. Um, and, you know, he if, if he was, that was the time probably in the 50s, the local priest would take the football off you if he saw you playing football. <laughs> As, you know. Sounds like Father it, Ted. It, it, <laughs> exactly what, what it's like. <laughs> and so he just, lo he just loved, lived and breathed for football. But so he, he, you know, when we so were growing up, he uh, played football every day with me in the back garden. And um, sorry, you get me emotionally. Sadly, passed away a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, way too, way too young. So it's, uh, um, but uh, yeah, I owe him everything. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was involved with Salt Hill Devon, I think, wasn't he? And and the Galway Cup as well. So I can remember reading his name a few years ago. 
Yeah, it was. Um, uh, he sold. So, to give you a bit of a backstory. Salt Hill Devon are like a grassroots club on the west coast of Ireland, and they have like a championship facility. So they've 4G pitches, loads of um, smaller astroturf pitches, six or seven immaculate pitches. Um, and they started, at, they restarted in the 70s and my dad was one of the founding members. And they've been really well run by people like Pete Kelly and Ollie Daniels. And what they did, they, they bought a plot of land, a builder had bought that land off them, built them more pitches. Then another builder offered them some more money for those pitches and they turned into the most, you know, the most fantastic club. And, and they hold tournaments every year, which Ipswich have indeed played in. So it's kind of a, a if, if you went and visited it, it's it's like this wonderful facility, in the middle of a, literally a bog um, <laughs> on the west coast of Ireland. And it's, yeah, so, uh, yeah, again, I know my dad is very proud to play a little part in that. Brilliant. So... To get to the point where, because we could go forensically through Rotherham and through Cardiff as well. So you were with Ronnie Moore at Rotherham and strangely considering the size of the two clubs, Rotherham and Ipswich seem to have become rivals in the past um, couple of three seasons. And then on to Cardiff, who were sort of establishing themselves at championship level at the same time as you sort of were. Is that fair? Um, yeah, well, I'd had a couple of seasons. I had a couple of really good seasons with Rotherham uh, in the Championship. And it got to the stage, it was time to move on, signed for Cardiff, and it was definitely a club on the up. But at, at that point, we didn't even have a training ground. Uh, and, you know, it sounds, it probably sounds unusual to young players now, you know, that's things like that would happen. I mean, we train in the middle of an athletics track. It was awful pitch, but that was what they've wonderful facilities now, but that's what they had back then. I had, I, I tried my best to Cardiff, but uh, actually I, I didn't start too badly, but I had a knee injury about four or five games in while away in Ireland duty, um, medial meniscus tear, quite a serious injury. So they tried to repair that. The repair failed. So I had another operation to take your meniscus out, the, your cushioning in, the, in your knee. And at that stage, I, you know, it's it's pretty embarrassing when you're when you're at a new club and you're injured. I came back, and I was I was in pain playing, and I was never quite right. I was never quite fit enough, and I never really I never really got going at Cardiff. You know, I had a good relationship with the fans, and the fans could see I could, you know, I was trying, but uh, they never saw the best of me, and I was never fully fit, and never mentally in in the right place either. But bizarrely, um, I I played well against Ipswich the year before, and. Uh, Dave Jones had taken over at Cardiff, really nice guy, but I, I wasn't his first choice. And I got wind that Ipswich were in for me and Joe Royal. And I used to, at that age, Ipswich had the best pitch you, you know, you'd ever play on. And anytime you went there, whoever I went there with, I, I always, you know, I always loved playing there. And someone like Joe Royal coming to buy you. You know, I felt, God, if I'd done really well at Cardiff, I might get a move to Ipswich. But, you know, I've, I've been really lucky here. I, I've not done well, but I've got an opportunity here. And just the minute I walked through the door, I just felt like I was home. And, you know, Joe Royal was the perfect manager for me. Um, I, you know, and I, I wanted to do, do well for him. So the kind of rest, rest was history. You score, you score a couple of goals when, you know, in your first couple of games makes things everything easier for a centre forward. So I, I, I just, you know, I, I just felt at home. Do you want to pick oh. up there, Phil? I, so I remember the Southampton game. It was your second game, wasn't it? I think, away yeah. at Southampton. I think goal really early on. And I think, it, um, yeah, it, you make your name, don't you? And as a striker, um, getting goals in your second game means exactly what you want, isn't it? I think you, you get, you, presumably, the pressure builds if you don't score early on. Well, it, it shows the if, if, if I played a game at Southampton two weeks earlier for Cardiff, I probably would have been dragged after 60 minutes, huffed and puffed. I felt invincible that day for Ipswich. Again, you know, I, I, I just, 
the game could have continued for another 45 minutes and I'd have kept running the channels <laughs> and just this energy. Um, I remember there was a corner with five minutes to go and we kept everyone back and I was in the, it was, I was in the middle and I, I, got, I got to the ball first. There was just no way anyone was going to beat me to that ball. And that, that's the power of your mind. You know, the, you know you, you, the difference between a confident player, a player with self-belief and one lacking it. It's amazing. Oh, oh, oh. And, and the knee wasn't impacting. I mean, I remember, you can tell me whether this is nonsense or not, but when you had your medical at town, was there sort of an issue with your knee then? I remember someone telling me that there was you, that they wouldn't insure you or something along those lines. Yeah, w w once you've a piece of your meniscus removed, you're on a time bomb. For I mean, I, I, it's funny, I saw the surgeon last week. I need a full knee replacement on that side. But we're, we're going to try and put it off as long as possible. Uh, you know, I have a lot of pain out of it and it's it's bone on bone but, so once you remove that you remove that meniscus yeah i was lucky to, i mean i played on an extra 10 years which was doing really well and um initially it was sore but i can't say it affected me it affected me that much for the rest of my career till the very end i had oh. a spell at Huddersfield where i was struggling with it but you you know once that meniscus goes your your days are numbered so you came into a side at that point. You got four goals in that half season, I think, with um, having joined in the January. It was it was a changing team, wasn't it? Because it was the team the year before with Shefki and Tommy Miller and Darren Bent uh, and Kelvin Davis. They'd all been sold the previous summer, hadn't they? And you came in in the January, really to sort of rescue the season because there was. I mean, I don't think there were any real danger of relegation, but I think it was kind of you know people, we were looking over our shoulders a bit at that point, and uh, I thought you, you you saw us to safety, didn't you? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, th I think everyone. Um, um, yeah, I don't think it was that quite that bad, but the, the place needed a lift. Um, I'd had a good f five or six games, but then there was a game in Crew, and we'd actually th were thinking we might still catch the playoffs. And I had a hamstring tweak, and Joe, uh, I, you know, I spoke to Joe beforehand about it, and we said, like, I said, I, I think. You know, I, I don't think it's good. I think, we, you know, we, we could we could step out for a week and it would be fine. But I played, scored a goal, and then sure enough, the hamstring went. So it was kind of one of those risks that we thought, well, we might as well take it. Um, but then I kind of missed. I got back for the end of the season. Um, but, yeah, again, going back to, you know, I, I liked Suffolk. Um the dress room is really good. There's some like really solid customers, you know, Jason DeVos, Jim Magilton, um, there were some wonderful players, Gavin Williams. I don't think Tommy Miller came back till the next year. Um, I remember playing a front with John Mackin. I think um, although that might have been the second year as well, Darren Curry, uh, some um Fabian Wilness, you know, all good characters, no knobheads. <laughs> so you can um, ask for <laughs> yeah and it, it was joe joe was brilliant he had a way of like i i remember once you know i had a bad first half against crystal palace away and joe at half time joe just says his bits and pieces and then he looks at me and he goes that's not you alan is it that's not real you is it that <laughs> And I remember thinking, no, no. And he just had this magic of knowing exactly what to say. At that moment, I'd have run through a brick wall from him. You know, I was going to go out for him second half because I wanted him to be proud of me. And and it, it was it was a mad, magical bit of man management. So uh, huge respect for him. I mean, that's Can what you... I always sorry. I was going to say what I always found about Joe when I was around the training ground. I went to interview him once, and I think I was going to go and do it in Milts's office, but then. Uh, at the training ground, um, but someone was using that office, and then he walked me through the building to the dressing rooms. But on the way, he had a word for everybody. Do you know what I mean? There was that table tennis room yeah. on the left, and he stuck his head in there, and, and there was some banter with whoever was in there. And it was just topping everybody up sort of thing. Do you know what I mean, morale-wise? Is that how, how you found it? Yeah, he, he had a lot of class. He was intelligent, and he had class, and he didn't have an ego. You know, he'd done everything. He didn't need to prove in so you very often you find people like that they they've got time for everyone and you know um it, it was yeah it it was it was a shame when he went and um i remember phoning him and you know I, I'd, I'd have loved him to stay on but 
Um, I, I only got to play with him for six months. I just wish it, it was a bit longer. I was just thinking that you're kind of the prototype, prototypical Joe Royal striker. When you look back even through Oldham and Man City, he always loved a big, powerful, direct, good running striker, didn't he? But um, what about the switch then from a elder statesman who, in your words, had done everything to one of your um, more, uh, what's the word we can use for Jim, Phil? One of your more self-confident teammates. <laughs> if ever there was a poacher turned gamekeeper, it was... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, J- Jim is like, um, I-, I remember actually, Jim was kind of, leaving the club and I remember we'd had a night out end of season and we were kind of certainly I was encouraging him I said like you know stay around you'll be manager one day and um I didn't expect it to happen that quick <laughs> and it was like it's funny because with Jim by the end of it we didn't get on but I, I get why and we're fine now do you know what I mean I phone him up now and I, I really want to see him do well and I think he's doing he's done, what he's done with Northern Ireland is that's fantastic but I think it's really hard if you've been, you know, if you've been on that side to then, ha- particularly with the older lads like me, Fabian, Daz, you know, we, we'd shared everything. Do you know what I mean? We knew about the nights out. We, you know, it, it's hard then to, to become the, the manager of that. So I get why probably it, it, it got testing at times, but listen, we, we had, we had a, really good i think second season our first season was a bit was a bit challenging um but um i loved it i think we we, we there was it, it, towards the end i think we went on a run that took us away from a bit of danger but again we i think we signed gary roberts so just a lovely guy we you know we um who was up front pablo came back i mean pablo canago what a player and the, the two of us just, um, oh, that might have been the season afterwards. Yeah, it was the season afterwards, wasn't it? John Mackin. Um, so we huffed and puffed that, that year. Yeah, you were 14, year, I think. And um, but, but you scored 17. <laughs> yeah, I scored 17. Scored my first hat trick. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd, that was probably my best season goals return I've ever had. But as Jim Jim would tell me, I should have had twenty odd more. Right? But <laughs> there you go. He was he was the, right. The, the, there was two years, weren't there? Where one was home form was fantastic, and the next year the, the away form was fantastic. It was much yeah. better. Um, yeah, I remember the year. I, th- I think it was the second year, and if we'd had an extra point, we'd have been in the playoffs. And you know, and I think, but um, you know, looking back, we. You know, I know I spoke to Andy Rhodes about that recently and he was saying maybe we should go do something completely different and go long ball or, you know, anything away from home to get that point. You know, maybe we should have mixed it up a bit more. Um, but kind of around that, you know, I think Marcus Evans had taken over and, and things, you just got a sense things were starting to change. Oh, I was going to come to that. Yeah, it was December yeah. 2007, wasn't it? That, that uh, yeah. Marcus Evans came in and, it, yeah, suddenly money from from because jim had been operating on a shoestring budget hadn't he and um suddenly there was money to to play with and 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 that january i think there was about 14 signings weren't there yeah i think it it, it's it it almost muddied the water a bit because before that we knew you know no, no one was on an obscene amount of money more than someone else yeah we had to get along. There was such a focus on team spirit and in this together. I felt that slightly changed. I know we signed one or two and the lads got to find out, you know, what the signing on fees were. And it just created a little bit of, when you're that player coming in, then you, you've got to do well. You've got to be that much better than the other players. And the signings didn't really work out that way. So it, it kind of, um, and, it, and it was a shame in the end because, um, um, it was a shame for Jim the way it ended because he didn't do a bad job, really. Oh, oh, as you say, that was that was two thousand um, 
Seven eight, wasn't it? That's right. That was the season where, as you say, one home record, one fifteen, drew seven, lost one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> remarkably good home yeah. record, but away only won three games. Uh, so and yeah. and you could and, and missed out on the playoffs in the final day. So uh, against Hull City, um, t t tough to take really. I, I imagine but when it's one point. I think on the final day you scored a goal, didn't you? Yeah, I came on. I came on. I came off the bench. Um, yeah, and scored a header, I think, with my second touch. Oh. And there was kind of a moment there where we thought, oh, we've got a chance here. Yeah. And it was, yeah. Great. It was a wonderful moment, you know, full house. Um, but at, at that stage, I'd kind of just started getting the feeling that, you know, I was surplus to requirements. Um, I'd turned down and moved to Hull. I could have, you know, to be fair, I put my money where my mouth is. I turned down and moved, which doubled my money. I said, I just don't want to do it. I want to stay here. And that was, you know, that was a few months previously. And then we'd signed new players who weren't really making an impact, but I wasn't being offered a new deal. And it kind of got to the stage where a new Crystal Palace came in, came in for me and there was a couple of other clubs. And I thought, you know, for my own sake now, um, the music's going to stop here. I need to grab myself a chair. Um, so um, it was, I was, I was really gutted to leave. Like genuinely got it, and and uh, you know I wasn't in when I first went to Palace. I wasn't in the right frame of mind because you know, I didn't really want to leave. Oh. But it was just the circumstances as it was that you felt the club was growing away from you in a way. Um. Yeah. I, and uh, yeah. And, and I felt. Um. You know, I, I think I could have. Again, there seemed to be this. I, I, I think when you're. After a couple of years, people start looking at you and saying, well, what can't you, what, looking and saying what you can't do rather right. than what you can do and what positive you bring. So um, I, I felt, you know, that that was where people had got with me in their opinion. But, I, you know, I think they suffered for it. I think, you know, I'd have, um, you know, I, I'd have continued to to be an asset. And I don't think they, they replaced me probably till Daryl Murphy. Mm. Ooh, no, no, out and out similar striker. Yeah, yeah I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we have to. You mentioned sort of not getting on with Jim terribly well. There's the Amsterdam trip, um, which I think was a bit of a storm in a teacup, really, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, no, that's exactly. I, I think in the scheme of things now, but part of the problem was I know that the, the year before Jim would Jim had done similar himself, not to Amsterdam. I think he'd gone to Edinburgh, and like. You know, so we we went away in the Monday night after a game and got back. We Tuesday, Wednesday off, and we came back Wednesday lunchtime. And kind of everyone knew people had been going to Ireland and all over the place. And you know, nowadays you go to the difference is you go to Dubai or something. But um, we had uh, there was some sort of incident. Me and Fabian just went to the hotel bar first night, but Gavin Williams and the young Scallywags were obviously <laughs> all on, on the streets. Anyway, they get they they pay someone. They want they want bikes, so they buy some bikes off some guys on the streets, thirty euros each or something. And they're cycling around. Next thing, the police stop them. Go listen, where listen English boys. Well, right, you're not brought bikes with you. Um, you know, we want to know. Oh no, hold on, we've got. You know, the, the, as the story goes, they were arrested, but they didn't. They brought the police back to the guys they bought the bikes from and said, no, they bought them, and the police let them off and away. Anyway. This turned into a massive story. The lads couldn't keep their mouths shut about us. And by the end of it, we were all arrested. Um, so anyway, the press got hold of us and it was just kind of all of a sudden we were being punished for going away. Um, so it, it wasn't best handled by the club, I have to say. But on the other hand, it was there was no harm done. And um, again, I think when you when you see some of the some of the stuff that happens now, it was it was pretty uh, pretty pantomime yeah and these days of course you'd have photographs all over social media while it was oh, yeah. actually happening I'd, I'd, hate, I'd, I'd hate to be you know i'd hate to be you know under that looking glass now um yeah. i've got to ask because i'll get strung up if not because you've done something that probably every single ipswich town fan would if they could be in one place at one time in front of a certain stand in a certain stadium in a certain um local derby so how to 
ingratiate yourself and win brownie points is score at the Barclay end at Norwich. And we still remember Danny Haynes doing it. And strangely, Jonas Knudsen a few times. Just talk, yeah. just talk to me about that goal because we've, it, you often talk to footballers and they're like, well, look, it's my job is a, it's another game, but you must know what that means to the fans. Uh, yeah, listen, I know what it means. I'd celebrate every goal like it's my last, but you, you, there's goals you score um, that obviously any, any, any playing against Norwich, there's oh, so much added extra on it. You know, now I used to love those, love the full houses, you know, and the noise, everything, the din, deafening. Um, but that that moment when you've scored and you're running away, honestly, you feel, uh, you know, you, you you feel you could win the Olympic 100 metres. You know, you feel <laughs> so strong. You feel so elated, whatever drug that goes through your system. Um, and that's why I, I, I never could arrange a celebration because you go bananas you, you know you're just there and my thing was I've punching you catch someone in the crowd and you're in the air and you just feel so wonderful and and that's the you know that's something that money cannot buy you cannot replicate that there's no way of replicating that apart from doing something special in sports and I'm not sure there's anything that compares to football and scoring a goal against your local rivals and the goal counts you know so I think it was to put us ahead um but I look back on that goal and what a like a touch from pa from Pablo and pass in behind. I mean, it was just magical. I couldn't miss. So it was uh, a great feeling. Pablo was rather a... rather modest there. Sorry, Phil. I was going to say about Pablo. I mean, he was a terrific player. Really, probably should have played at a higher level, shouldn't he? Um, yeah, he had he had the ability. He, he you know, I think other, I think clubs were looking at him. Um, I mean, I we struck up a good partnership. I wouldn't say we were close friends or anything, um, but he was, we had an understanding on the pitch and if there was space to run in behind, that would be me. Um, and if, and then he'd start high, drop into a hole, twist and turn. And you know, we'd probably find a way to get through to you. So we complemented each other so well. Um, yeah. Huge admiration for him. So is he the, the sort of strike your favourite strike partner through your career? Because you've had and, and you've had different sorts of strike partner. I can remember you telling me about and I can't think who it was, your strike partner at Rotherham. But it was it was again it's a slightly different partnership, wasn't it? Um I played with Jordan Rhodes a lot at Huddersfield. Right, and that, yeah. that was probably as close to a, you know a Pablo. Um Earnshaw. Uh, uh, Robert Earnshaw. Yeah, I played with Ernie. Um Again, I wouldn't say I was at my best or I was a great foil for him. Um, Rotherham was kind of mixed up. He used to play a bit with Richie Barker, um, a lovely guy. And we, again, we were two target men, but we'd work, whenever yeah. we played together, we'd work really well. Uh, let me see. Um, John Mackin was a really intelligent footballer. And again, he'd drop into the hole a bit more. Uh, Franny Jeffers, really clever player. Yeah, I think, I think Pablo and Jordan Rhodes were my favourite to play with. So there's this crazy season where when I tried to write it down um, and I didn't think you could play for three teams in the season. I thought there was rules against this. But so in 2008, <laughs> 2009, you start at Ipswich, who you score for. You go to Palace and then score against Ipswich. You go on loan to Norwich and then you're playing for Norwich against Ipswich at the end of the season. And then you score in the last game of the season for, for Norwich, who are then relegated what <laughs> any stability there at all <laughs> yeah pretty mad well I, I went to palace got injured in my first session pulled a hamstring um the physio had doing these these mad like um strength tests on a machine and i'd obviously tweak my hammy it wasn't diagnosed right and i i'd torn it three times before you know i tore it another two times so it was so embarrassing, horrible. Um, got back into the team eventually, but was just head was all over the place. Half living in London, not living on, li not living right. Um, my fiance, we weren't engaged then, but my girlfriend was living back in Suffolk, and I just hated every moment of it. And um, 
uh, Gunny had got the job at Norwich and asked if I wanted to go on loan. And Neil Warnock was good as gold about it. Said, "Listen, no hard feelings, but you know, you, you get to go back home and everything." And I, I went back. You know, it, it couldn't. I, I know upset Ipswich fans and all that, but I'm a professional. I needed to go back. And I needed to be back at home. I need to go back to Dedham, not be travelling in, in and out in London. Just be settled. It was the best thing for for me. So. Um, I, I went to I went back went to Norwich. I, I actually we got relegated, but they gave me Player of the Month, and it took me <laughs> <laughs> and bizarrely. You're still thinking about the bad thing, news, yeah? <laughs> but the first game, they, you know, they, they were they weren't doing well. They had a load of lone players. They just weren't at it. And I put it around, put it about a couple of games, and I, I did well. I played really well for them, and by the end of it, they were you know they were quite appreciative. And I'd, I'd have signed there, if you know, if I could have, but it wasn't to be. Um, go back to Crystal Palace, and um, you know, Neil Warnock's not made it personal, but he just wants me out the door. I kind of half do pre-season. I, got, I wasn't even meant to go on the end of season, the pre-season tour, but I ended up going on at late, and um, I was actually doing all right all of a sudden. You know, I was injury free. First game of the season, Stern John goes off with a broken arm. I come on and score the winner. And it was, you know, it was funny. And I'll give you an insight into Neil Warnock. So I'm starting the next couple of games and I'm doing quite well. But he takes me off at half time. No explanation. And I thought I'd done all right in the first half. We're losing 1-0. It doesn't say anything to me. And um, I go back... Uh, I was living, we had an agreement, I could live back in Suffolk and travel up for training and back again. And he pulled me off and he goes, where were you Friday night? I go to see him Monday morning. Where were you Friday night? Well, I was in flat in London. Why were you in London? I said, were you saying that? I wasn't out or anything. No, no, I, I know you weren't out, but why were you in London? I said, I saw your car in the car park and I thought, I said, well, Gaffer, you said I could live at home during the week, but you it's a three-hour drive on a match day. You don't want me doing that, sure. He goes, no, 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 no. He said, I was wrong to take you off, but I thought you'd gone to London and I forget, get different energy from me from London, if, if you come in from London. So <laughs> I want you to drive in. Doesn't I don't care if you're late. If you're late, just phone me and tell me, fine, no problem. He said, I want you to drive in from Suffolk for games um, as well. Um, <laughs> but it was brilliant because very often, if you have a long drive, it's not the drive itself. It's the fact that you might be late makes you anxious. But I was driving in. I'd leave early. I'd have some lunch at the ground for 12. And I actually quite liked the arrangement. But he, it was something Neil Warnock had seen. And he said, you've got to be coming into the countryside, settled, at home. And you're a better player and a better person when you do that. That's interesting. Right. Element, element, of, right. yeah, of his, element of his man management. Again, someone else who... If, if, if Kieran has spoken before, I think, about Neil Warnock's man management and how he... He found that so sort of uh, um, <laughs> impressive. Um, Huddersfield next, we, we, that was your next club, I think, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I suppose my, my, my last club proper, I suppose. Um, I'd started, we obviously, people know about the season at Crystal Palace. I'd just my favourite season in football that year. Oh, yeah. And we stayed up on the last day of the season and it was just magical. Apparently, you can watch a documentary yeah. on it. <laughs> Um, yeah, tell us about so, that. Tell us well, all about that season. Um, well, we we'd gone into we were in the playoff positions after about ten, twelve games. Forgive me if I if I get the, the dates wrong, but anyway, we were flying up to Newcastle for a game against Newcastle United. We get off the planes and we've been told we get our te- messages that we're um, gone into administration. We got ten point deduction, which put us like fourth and bottom, like sixth to. You know, or there, thereabouts to right now, we're in a relegation fight. We lost, we as as we joke, we sold all our good players like um, um, uh, Jose Fonte, Nathaniel Klein. Um, oh god, who's the guy who went to Wigan and uh, Chelsea? Uh, Victor Moses, Victor Moses, how oh, can I forget Victor Moses? Great player. Um, 
but what we were left behind was really um, just unbelievable characters. So Clint Hill, Sean Derry, Paddy McCarthy, D uh, Danny Butterfield, um, and we'd we'd an absolute class player, Darren Ambrose, on the left, um, playing on the left of me, and we all just knew our jobs. Everyone just dug in. I mean, Paddy McCarthy's shoulder must have popped out about five or six times, but he kept playing. It, it was astonishing. But we we didn't do too bad. We probably in in the championship. If you have a bad run of ten games, and then you have an average run, you'll be down in the bottom. If you can have ten good games, and the rest of the season average, you'll probably be up near the top. So we'd. It's quite a, it can make such a difference a deduction of ten points. Um, uh, so we were going to the last game of the season. The fans were behind us because they tell we were giving our all. We didn't deserve to be in there. We we're playing Sheffield Wednesday at Hillsborough. If we drew or won, we stayed up. If they won, they stayed up. So um, I've never seen a crowd like it or the amount of, I mean, there was television stations from all over the world there. The, the car park was full of like the TV satellites, satellite trucks. Um, and kind of, yeah, you know, the nerves, the, the, the nervous adrenaline. Um, but as it happened, um, but near, quite early on, Darren Ambrose put, Great corner on a plate. A rose stuck into the back of the net. Uh, ran Darren over in my celebration. Nearly knocked him out. <laughs> and, and we just dug in and, you know, they equalised. We scored another. Darren Ambo scored. They scored one. And then there was... I was done with about 10 minutes ago. I was absolutely shattered. And they took me off. And um, I mean, watching that game, those last six or seven minutes of time added on, it was just... Um, it just felt like an eternity. Um, but we, we drew and we stayed up and the fans, there was a pitch invasion. It was just such, so emotional. I've, I've never experienced anything quite like it. But for me, it was weird. I just I just burst out crying. You know, I was so proud of what we'd done and what this group of, of, of players had done and people. And so I, I didn't even go out for the celebration that night. I, I remember just crying in the corner of the dressing room really content peaceful feeling and just drove home that night and had a couple of pints i think in the the sun in and dedham <laughs> well, it was a huge, huge achievement so we come on to to, to to huddersfield then your time there with with jordan rhodes as you say i think tommy miller was with you there as well wasn't he tommy was there yeah we'd um lee clark lee clark was there and he he had a fantastic few years but he just signed people on their character and the, the type of characters. So we had um, um, the owner was was making a big push. You know, eventually they got to the premiership. But we just had the the best bunch of lads. Um, no, no one was big time. No knobheads. Um, everyone went out together. Everyone were, were, was prepared to work hard. We went 40-odd games unbeaten across two seasons. Um, but we didn't get it done first year, which is a big disappointment. We, we didn't turn up for the playoff final. And, you know, it was a huge regret um, and such a shame. But I think the pressure got to us. And we didn't prepare right for the final, and Peterborough did us. Um, but we um, um, next season, we continued the run on, um, got to the playoffs, uh, Simon Grayson come in and taken over um, from um, from Lee Clark. Um, we had the playoff final, and I was play I, I was a sub. I was injured. I, my knee was twice as big as it should be, and we'd um, penalty penalty shootout. I was there. I, I was, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember two two days before. I thought. God, I can just see it now. I don't feel right. I shouldn't be playing. And I bet, I bet this goes to penalties and I'll have to take one. And I had a really <laughs> negative feeling. That's just not me. So on the day, it's nil all. It's the hottest day uh, at Wembley. Tommy Miller steps up. A banker normally misses his penalty. They score. 
Damien Johnson steps up, misses his penalty, they score. In some bizarre logic in my head, I thought, right, all I have to do is hit the target. This will go in. I've never seen – no one saves three in a row. And I hit, like, the most awful penalty. They save it, and that, that walk back, and you feel – you know that moment. I said, "Right, I've decided. I'm. I've let. You know, I've let. You know, forty thousand people down here today. My teammates. We've not achieved what we were paid to do. I'm going to go in and I'm going to forego the last year of my contract and just quit. I'm out of it. I can't. This. You know, I felt so low because there's no way on earth we're getting back from that. And somehow they miss their next three. Um, we score next two, and it goes all the way to the keepers, and it's decided. And um, yeah, that was um, it. Was I was I was so lucky, I was so lucky. As Gary Roberts said, we got we put all our we decided to get all our worst penalty takers out of the way early. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we uh, yeah we got promoted. Um, next season. Uh, started okay. I was kind of a sub. I was struggling with my knee. You know, I was on my way out then. You know, I, I could, um, I could come on, make an impression from the bench, but I was, um, I, I couldn't train every day. I had to do a lot of cycling, and as well, we we'd signed some characters that weren't wasn't quite the same. Um, went on a really bad run. Simon Grayson. Uh, was sacked. Mark Robbins, who I'd played with, came in, ca came in, and kind of like immediately bombed me out and said, "Listen, you're not going to be involved." And you know, thanks, Al. And I said, "Oh, okay," but I, I, you know, I, I did things right. But then he 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 started well, and then went on a bad run, and then phoned me up one night and said, "Alan, listen, need to use you here. Just thinking if we could, you know, get you back involved and maybe get you on the bench and all this." And I was like, "Robbo." I'm still training every day. I'm, you know, I'm I'm doing everything right. I've not changed the way I've been, but you know, I'll come back and be professional. But we managed to stay up. Um, got messed around a little bit with um, the contract. You know, I think the chairman had wanted me to stay on. Mark Robbins had said, "Oh yeah, we'll sort all that out." Day after the season went, he got, "Listen, Al, we're not going to offer you anything," and it just felt a bit, a little bit left a little bit of a sour note. Um, but we just had our first child, uh, Eva, uh, and at that stage, unfortunately, we knew Dad was dying, and he, he was living in Dedham, and kind of just there was so much going on in my personal life. Um, I thought, let's just move. We'll, we'll, let's move back in with your mum. Let's just get home. You go now. Take the baby. I'll I'll pack up the house in Huddersfield, and and like that, you go from being settled, expecting another year, to back home living in my mother-in-law's. Um, so it was it was a really disruptive time, you know, really tough time. But uh, I remember I'd started my my coaching badges the year before, but I needed some hours coaching, and I'd asked Brian Clue if I could come into the academy. And it must have been late July, and I was doing a bit with a young team. You know, I didn't know what I was doing basically, but Mick and Terry Connor were at the pitch beside us. So when I was finished walked over to Mick and I said, just said, listen, Mick, thank you very much for letting me come in, um, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes, well, what are you doing? I said, well, it looks like I'm retired. And he goes, well, have you been keeping fit? And uh, I lied and said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> goes, listen, why don't you come in, train tomorrow and play a reserve team game? He said, there, there, there won't be a position here as a player, but we just need some good people around and you, you might fit. So I came, scored in the the twenty threes game the next day, and uh, ended up signing as like a player coach. Thanks for watching or listening to the Blue Monday podcast, and thanks to those of you who have kindly supported the channel via Acast or YouTube donations. You can follow us at the usual places on social media, and don't forget to subscribe so that you get our new shows first.